Looks like there's more of you than there's supposed to be. Let's see, three, 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 and two more. Uh, Orlis is nine. Um, Nick Agnioni's not here, he's on a business trip. He said I need an email. That means there's even more. Yeah. <laughs> what happened? Oh well. So there may not be enough things here. Hey, let's see. Here so you got some emails from me, right? Yeah. One described the first writing assignment. And the other described some elements of the second one. True? Mm -hmm. Yes. You all got it. I mean, you're not, this is not totally a surprise, shock, all, all shucks, or, um, okay. There may be an extra one there. Who knows? And, um, the final ingredient for the night. I guess I should refer to these as recipes more than ingredients. So the bias is to where the people who sit by the door see they're they're assured getting stuff. They may not get over here to you. Just if they don't, however, we'll we'll take care of that later. Um, okay. Let's talk about change. How many of you have actually been through changes? I mean, other than adolescence. How many of you have jobs? Okay. Any, any, uh, you know, stuff hit the fan at your job since you've been working there? No? Yes. Yes. Oh, I was going to say, what planet are you working on? <laughs> I mean, this is a a time in history where noted for instability. It's crazy. You're going to work, you don't know whether you're going to get paid this week or not, right? It's a good bet you're not going to get a raise. Right? Anybody work here? <laughs> you wouldn't get a raise. Uh, so, what are the uncertainties? And what does that do to you? I mean, does uncertainty bother you? How many of you are really cool about the vagaries of life, you know, hey, come say, come saw, you know, it can, it can rain, it can be a tornado, I'll be cool. You see some of these guys that play quarterback, you know, they're sitting there, and it's like, you shoot at them, and they, they just wouldn't flinch, they just, little, little dumb someplace up here, maybe. Um, is that admirable? How many of you get a little flustered by some of this uncertainty? This, yeah, you're not comfortable with this. So when people say, oh yeah, I like change, you know what I say? Hell you do. Because most people don't like change. Rosabeth Moss Cantor, who's had a very fascinating career, she started off as a sociologist, and wrote a book about the sociology of organizations and found herself being moved from the Harvard Sociology Department to the Harvard School of Business. A good move. The business school people get paid about four or five times as much. So these days, she's the most recognizable, the most famous, and the most often invited to speak person in the School of Business. She could use a little consulting with some of her costumes. <clears throat> I, was, I was recently on a luncheon with her and she gave an after lunch speech. And you know, when you're 70 years old and you put on a few pounds, just stop wearing knitted costumes that ride up and expose parts of your tummy to the world. Other than that, though, she's really a smart cookie, writes great books. Welcome back. She wrote a book. Her first book that really was a huge bestseller dealing with this whole issue of change was a book called The Change Masters. And this book described a bunch of major corporations and how they handle plan change. There's two kinds of change. Change you plan for, 
James does. Pitch in the back of the head. You know, big surprise. Are most of the ones that bother you stuff you plan for? Yeah. No. Somebody pulled off a whack and you didn't notice. Like a sucker punch. You know what that is? That's where you're walking along and somebody else would be just sitting all, all of a sudden hit you someplace and you go, know, ooh. Probably happened. You're, you're, you're gross. You're, people don't do that among the females, right? It's just the males do stupid things like that to harm one another. Right? Girls just say mean things, right? There's that movie Mean Girls. Yes, yes. Plan change. Plan for it, right? And the planning is interesting sometimes. Cantor talks about a company where the way they communicated symbolically to the employees was really interesting. They had all this, this of course, you can tell me what state you think this happened in as I describe it. So raise your hand and say, I think it's this state. They had the top. 20% of the employees invited to this event where they were going to announce their annual goals for performance. So you got all these people at this resort. They get them all into a big auditorium. And the top executives are telling them about their performance and what's expected and giving them kind of rah rah presentation. Some of you look like you could use it. And then they heard them all outside, and they put them into buses, and they drive them to the beach. And there on the beach, you know, it's all set up resort-like. There on the beach, they see marching toward them elephants. You ever seen an elephant marching toward them? First elephant, this is like the three bears, only the three elephants. The first elephant is the smallest elephant. It has on its back like a blanket, and the blanket has a message. It has this, a number, dollar figure for last year's performance of the company. So many millions. Okay? The next elephant is bigger, and it has a bigger number on the side. The third elephant is the biggest elephant, and it has the biggest number. And that, of course, is our goal for next year. That's what we're going to do. We're going to make offer for millions and billions of dollars. And symbolically, you, you see this because we're going to be the biggest elephant. So what state do you think? Thank you. <laughs> that was a pretty obvious guess. <clears throat> I mean, I mean, what else do you associate with weird symbolic things like that? <laughs> Outrageous things like that? But California, I mean, really, Georgia? Getting an elephant to help that's a real pain in the butt. It's an island. Florida, maybe, you know, that's, that's a really strange place, too. So. But here we are. The study of change started a long time ago. Now, I know that all of you were forced at gunpoint to take a course in philosophy. Isn't that true? Did you enjoy it? The, the nodding heads have ceased. <laughs> Did you learn anything about philosophy? Name three philosophers. Uh, like Socrates. Who? Socrates. Socrates. I Socrates, think that, like Greek that's philosophy. a clothing you wear while you kick around balls. <laughs> Socrates. Uh, oh. Socrates. Yes. And he was from where? Greece. <laughs> a long, long time ago in Greece. Yes, okay. So what did Socrates do? What did he say? 
Why is he doing this? Why would we study him? See, <laughs> based upon your response to this, I suggest that we use this as evidence for the elimination of the philosophy department. <laughs> they're obviously producing no results. Not one of you who was forced to take these courses. Right? Now, all of you didn't go to school here, right? Where'd you go? Um, I went to Millersville. Millersville? No philosophy? Um, no, I took it. Took, mm -hmm. what, what was it? What, how many? One or just two? One. Just one. Mm -hmm. Just one. Went to Shippensburg. How many philosophies? One. One. But the guy who taught it had like a cable access TV show where he pretended that he was on Mars. <laughs> and that's what we talked about in the class. Being on Mars. Like a visiting professor for the semester. Was, Do they yeah. ever <laughs> visit any Mars today? No. That was the last semester. And at the end of the semester, he we sent him back to Mars. And we told him what grade he went in. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> Say the University of Miami and a lot of stuff like that. Yeah. <laughs> Basket weaving. And, and where were you? For sinus. Did they do anything like that? Yeah, we had to take something called the Common Intellectual Experience, CIE 1 and 2. The Common Intellectual Experience. Mm -hmm. Common is to not have an intellectual experience, isn't it? I mean, I don't know. How many, how many philosophers did you learn about? Um, a good deal. A good deal? Is that like getting yeah. a bargain? Or? Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I don't really remember much from it, though. It was freshman year. Freshman year is a, just a yeah. haze, you know. <laughs> Some people go to parties all the time freshman year. Some people pump iron all freshman year. Some people drop out after freshman year. <laughs> Where were you? Elon University, North Carolina. And did they have philosophers there? Probably. Probably. You, you, you didn't take it. They didn't, they didn't make you take it. No. Yeah, so. <laughs> uh, my contention is that for most people, they have to be hogtied to do that. See? And, I, and I knew that, see. In high school, I was interested in philosophy, but I used to go to the library, but I'd never tell anybody that that's what I was reading. Because I figured, this is going to get in trouble. It was very useful to be fast because people who found out those things about you would chase you, chase you and harass you. So as long as you could outrun them, you were safe. You went to school to Alama. I did. Yeah. So they made you take two? Um, well, we had to take two core humanities, which are basically philosophy classes, and then two philosophy classes. Okay. So name three philosophers. Um, Descartes, Plato, Charles and Socrates, Aristotle. I know. I could name them. I don't know. I don't remember. You don't know what they, what they were all about? No. They had a lot of questions. <laughs> <laughs> Not a lot of answers. Oh, great. Is that right? They had questions but no answers. Isn't that a pain? But my father was like that. He was always asking me questions. He wouldn't give me any answers. He so couldn't figure it out. Here. But it was useful there. And that, yeah. and that, but what, what person among the philosophers you just named? was famous for being like my father. <laughs> you should know that. Yeah. You're born. Yeah. No, it's not Descartes. <laughs> what, what, country was, what country was Descartes in? Oh, good. She didn't even take philosophy. She knows the answer. <laughs> her, her, her absorption rate is good. <laughs> It's like I just don't hang out in the right bar, you know, the near philosophers, and they'll talk about stuff like that, and they're drunk and stupid. Where'd you go to school? Did they have philosophy there? They did, not take it. You didn't take it. You were deprived. <laughs> and you went to Villanova. Did you learn any philosophy? At one point, I, I feel like they teach it in every class at Villanova. In every class in Villanova? <laughs> pretty much, they bring it up. <laughs> they bring it up. <laughs> yeah, especially me. <laughs> Why is he bringing this stuff up again? I thought we were done with it. So, so which philosopher was the one who was a pain in the neck by asking questions? Oh, you mean Socrates, like the Socratic method? Exactly what I mean. See, there's just a time thing. You know, he comes back and you're like, bingo. Yeah, right, right. 
And you went to where? St. Joe's. St. Joe's. Well, that's a Jesuit school. My God, they must have lots of philosophy there, right? A bit. A bit. I have two. Two. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, that ties you with Villanova. So, what can you tell us about Socrates? Just that he was a thinker and. Or Rose. <laughs> and the Socratic method. Which was? To ask questions. They had no answer, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, so what happened to him anyway? Why is he famous? Is he the one that uh, committed suicide with Hamlet? Poison? Is that really suicide, I wonder? <laughs>
Yeah, they wouldn't have this stuff required if it wasn't important. But maybe the problem is that nobody has a way of explaining to you why it's important. Socrates is so pivotal. Why is he so pivotal? You know? Where'd you go? McDaniel. McDaniel. Where's that? In uh, Maryland. In Maryland. Mm -hmm. Down south in Maryland. Are you above or below the Mason Dixon line? Um, below. Below. So okay. that's a southern school. And where'd you go? Drexel. Drexel. Mm -hmm. They don't have philosophy there, right? They do, but they I repressed do. it. <laughs> but you repressed it? I repressed it. <laughs> Yeah, they, they only She was a psychology major. You know, she's being very Freudian with us now. I repressed it. Yes. Um, okay, so, but do you know anything about philosophy just by osmosis? How much? By, by you know, being in the library or reading comic books about famous, you know, classic comics from famous philosophers? No? Mm -mm. I remember reading it and putting it on paper. So that was the end of it. Yeah, you know, it goes in the eyes and <laughs> comes out. Mm -hmm. huh, okay, now what? So, so why? Why is this guy important? Never, never ask yourself. Because in philosophy, if you take a course like I did, which was probably not a good idea in some way, when I was an undergraduate, I had these friends who were a little older than I was, who I kind of knew from hanging out in this coffee shop on campus. And they uh, were philosophy majors. And they, they encouraged me, who had had all of two philosophy courses at that point, yeah, like sophomore level courses. Oh, take this course, History of Western Philosophy. It's great. You'll learn everything you need to know about all the philosophers from the beginning of time to now. And they were very persuasive. I mean, they could have sold used cars. It was very interesting what they had to say. So I did it. I signed up for it. Wow. Did I know what I was getting into? No, I didn't. What I was getting into was a two-semester sequence that was basically like graduate work. And in case you haven't taken a real graduate course, because I know some of the graduate courses that people take are kind of Mickey Mouse. Real graduate courses require that you read several books and that you write papers that mean you have to understand stuff and have lots of citations. You've got to become expert on things. <clears throat> well, I never had, you know, half the courses that you're undergraduate and write papers in, right? You take multiple guest tests. I remember this one course in the psychology of adjustment that I had to take. I used to arrive in the library at 9 o'clock in the morning to take a test at 10 o'clock. And I would speed read through the three chapters and make a few notes on what was in the summaries of the chapters and go in and ace every one of them. It wasn't real challenging. No papers, just quizzes. Final exam. Piece of cake. Did I learn much in that class? Nah. Nah. A lot of substance. It was like, it was like eating sushi. You know? Half hour later, you starve. So, what about this other course? The professor was this guy who, two years earlier, received his PhD from Princeton. His name was Max Hocutt. In those days, this was back when Jim Croce was, he was a student at the same time I was. You know who Jim Croce was? Well, this is the Villanova background, folks. There are two really famous graduates of Villanova that, that count for something. One of them is Howie Long. The other is Jim Croce. Now you probably know about Howie Long because you see him on TV all the time, right? He's the one with the cop hair. So we don't even know who Howie Long is. Yeah. He, uh, 
Let me hear it again, the whole thing. Mm. It is. Yeah, it, was, it wasn't too long after he retired, right? Yeah. He was that good. One of our HRD graduates from the beginning of the program, the guy by the name of uh, Bill Fleshman, <coughs> who was a guard who practiced opposite Howie, has told me a hundred times, and he told me once, how practicing across from Howie was really rough. <laughs> he was covered with bruises every day. So Howie Long is, is this guy who is very famous defensive end for the Raiders. Who is a student at Villanova, met his wife at Villanova, used to hang out outside my office waiting for her to take a break from her job in the classic languages department back in those days. And of course, when he stopped playing football, uh, he was smart enough to learn to speak very well and stand up straight in front of the camera. And of course, he also uh, comments on professional football uh, as one of the uh, well-paid guys on what <coughs> networks he has. Uh, CBS uh, or is it Fox? Or Fox. Fox. Okay. So, um, it's a good life. I think he's reached a point in life where even his oldest child is playing football now. And Jim Croce, on the other hand, had a little different life story. Uh, in 1973, he died in a plane crash. Just as he had something like four top ten hits going for him. He wrote a heck of a lot of very great songs. And, uh, and they all got popular right in the early 70s. But he told the kids at this school down south where he had been forced to miss the concert for them the previous year that he'd definitely come back. When he missed the concert, he was kind of an unknown. But a year later, he was really big. But he was going to go back. And he gave the concert there. And then when the plane was taken off with his band, for some reason, it didn't quite get enough elevation to get to the runway in one of these little towns. And it clipped some trees. That was it. Bad, bad Leroy Brown, you ever hear that song? Time in a Bottle? I mean, the, the, the list is, is long. So, he was a psychology major in the mid 60s. And what's funny is if you look at this picture in the yearbook, the tie and blazer, because all the boys, there was a boys school back then. The only females are nursing students. I'm not even sure they started yet. And um, a couple of years later, the picture's on the album cover. He's got a stogie sticking out of his mouth. He's got a mustache, Fu Manchu down the here. Kind of a mop of hair. And, Different image. The lyrics also convey a different image. Guy from South Philadelphia. So, yeah, that's somebody from Philadelphia. There was another person who had been the victim of a plane crash a few years earlier who was a, a, a big star that you might have heard from. He was from Texas. He was Buddy. You heard of Buddy Holly? Wow. And yeah, what'd you hear about Buddy Holly? Teddy died in a plane crash. Yeah. <laughs> you know any of his songs? Uh, Susie Q, something like that. Susie Q was. Was Buddy Holly. Well, he had one song related to what we're talking about in this course, change. It's a song called Every Day. And what ha what's happening every day according to that song? Mm -hmm. You know that much everybody out there. <clears throat> every day changes are going faster. Not only are there more changes, but the changes are going faster. The changes are going faster. Things are changing faster. Funny thing, you wrote that in 58. 
by 1970, a futurist who became very famous doing that work wrote something called Future Shock, which was about how it is that that's exactly what's happening. Everything is changing faster and faster. In fact, it's changing so fast that people are doing weird things to cope with the rate of change. One of the weird things that he wrote about at that time was that people were having, <clears throat> well, the radio stations were having oldies stations. You have no idea that oldies stations were going on back in the 60s even. Well, yeah, there were people who wanted to listen to the music from the 50s. Now, I mean, you find some stations that have 50s music, 60s music, yeah, the whole thing. How many of you have satellite radio in your car? Only one. Shocker. <laughs> Came with the car. Do you have XM or the other one? I think it's Sirius. Sirius. Is that the one with Howard? I had it. It was too expensive. I got rid of it. Well, you know, Howard Sirius is going to go broke, you know, pay your dues. <laughs> So even in the arts, even in the popular culture, we've got a recognition showing up. Starting in the 50s, into the 60s, the things were just changing too fast. What was happening to people as a result of all these changes? Uh, when you think about all these changes. We're scared. You're, you're scared. Fear is one thing. OK, another word. Resistant. Resistant to what? To changing anything? Yeah, you don't want to change. I don't want to change anymore. Change is a lot of work. Every time they change something, it's, it's a lot of work. A new software release comes out. And we have version 4.0. We had last year 3.0, the year before 2.0. Every time you got to learn stuff again, right? It's a pain in the neck. All this unknown. What does it do to you? Make you feel good? You already said no. One word I'm looking for. Efficient for the word. when we got too much. Oh, these nice pieces of chalk. They don't look like acid tablets. One of these curves, <coughs> what's the psychology majors here? Let's see. What? Two. Are you raising your hand? That's pretty subtle. Three, four. Five, six, seven, eight. So, <clears throat> what was your major? Um, I have two bachelors. The first one was commercial art with a psych minor, and then um, fashion design for the second. So you kind of danced around psychology. You were psychologically artistic. <laughs> sure. <laughs> and you? So she 
Sociology. Sociology. Music performance. Music performance. Are you a singer or a player? Percussion. Play. Percussion. Are you a drummer? Not in the sense of rock band, but yes. <laughs> you mean you stand there and you wait for the right count to go boom? Yeah. <laughs> hey, that's critical. You get it the wrong time and everybody's got a cow. Yeah, exactly. Wait a minute, that was off. <laughs> it's like somebody who <laughs> is flat. Or inappropriately sharp. So, there's a, um, a psychological law for all of you, psychology. It has to do with the relationship between performance and arousal. Let's see, how many of you had to take physiology and psychology? Let's see. You didn't do chalk up there. So some of you dodged that one because of course that's one of those scary courses. It's worse than statistics. Because you have to learn about surgery. Did you have to do surgery? Yeah. Animals? Brain did that. Whose brain did you use? A sheep. A sheep? I don't let you do anything this damn shit. <laughs> Here, here's my brain thing. <laughs> um, so you learn where different things happen in the sheep spring, localization of function. Okay. <laughs> Did you learn about the central nervous system? <laughs> what do you know? What's the central nervous system? How about the out of town nervous system? I mean, <laughs> What else did you learn about in there? Did you learn about the autonomic nervous system? What do you know about that? That like it responds to situations like stressful situations, your autonomic nervous system allows you release excess levels of cortisol in your brain and that makes you feel more stressed. Like, there are certain levels of cortisol in your brain that'll actually make you have peak performance. There's like, too much cortisol that you want. So, so let's say that if this is a performance, this could be peak performance, right? But over here, this is off peak. I mean, you're not doing too good. Now, have you ever tried to perform anything? I don't know. Anybody do anything athletic here? Tennis balls? Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> What'd she say? You wish? <laughs> Anything else? So what happens? What happens when you're trying to perform and you're half asleep? Why? What's well, more than your brain? It's the all the connections from the brain through the central autonomic nervous system. It all has to be working well to allow you to perform. Things like reaction time. You know, we just give you a stimulus and we see how long it takes you to respond. How many of you took driver's education? <laughs> you may have an accident when they were taking driver's education. No? Sometimes it happens because people get distracted. Do they, do they use a little device where they have you sit in a chair and they test you and have a light come on and see how fast you can put your foot on the brake? To get your simple reaction time? See, they used to do that back in the horse buggy days. Of course, they stopped doing that. Very practical because it shows you that you've got to pay attention or if you're not, you might run into somebody's rear end in front of you, and you're responsible because you're not supposed to do that. Does the same thing happen if you're already jacked up with five gallons of coffee? And you're... If you're always, if your arousal is too high, do you make mistakes? 
Maybe you'll slam on the brakes at the wrong time, too hard, and somebody behind you is going to run into you. So we have both of these kinds of things. In other words, when, you're, when your arousal is too high, over here, too high, your performance is off. When it's too low, it's off. The curves are different depending on what you're doing. If you're trying to repair a watch, something delicate like that, the curve moves. It, it's, it moves down. So that the, the point where your optimal performance is, is at lower levels of arousal. On the other hand, if you're doing something that's forceful, it requires you to use every bit of energy and strength you've got, then the curve moves up. I mean, that, uh, anybody ever watched the pre-game activities of the New Orleans Saints? Do we know the name of the quarterback? Drew. Drew. What first name basis? <laughs> no, no, Mr. Breeze. It's just, uh, yeah, they, they, they get out there and they're, he's, he's leading them in the, the champ, which may or may not help. What are they playing next week? The bad boys from Dallas? Well, you can guess who I'm rooting for. Mr. Breeze. <laughs> Mr. Bush and others in that game. Hell of the Cowboys. <laughs> On the other hand, I can also say, the hell with that Batman Reed, because he's what's wrong with the Eagles. Just not an editorial opinion. And I'm sure the half of you could care less about, who cares about the Eagles? Right? Or as, as my father-in-law likes to call them, the pigeons. So, so over here, your performance is off because your arousal is too hot. Here it's off because it's too low. So what happens? <laughs> you go drink two gallons of coffee, you get yourself up, and you miss. You took too much coffee, and now you're over here. And your performance is still. So we're, we're always concerned about getting our performance adjusted so we can perform well. So stress is not all bad. But one of the big things that we worry about with too much change, too much uncertainty, is that we sometimes feel like we need a tranquilizer. Yeah? So people take pills, prescription pills, often. Who is, who is the entertainer? Didn't somebody just die recently overdose of prescription pills? An actor or actress or something? That was a couple years ago. Oh, yeah, right, 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 right. So, it's not all you know, heroin on the streets and stuff like that. It's, it's going to see problems. And a lot of this stuff is tied to your work, especially what's going on with the uncertainties of rock stars and other people like that. That's their work. So, we got a lot of problems with change. It, it has ramifications. And who was this professor at Harvard I was talking about a few minutes ago? Hmm? Cancer. First name? Middle name? Yeah. Right, good, 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 good. See? See, it's all good. Enough. Somebody pays attention. Yeah, what is what Moss came So, she was, she was the first person who wrote a book about management, dealing with these corporate culture issues. And, and she wrote about this, this stuff like, the, yes, Virginia, change is a lot of work. You know, yes, Virginia is a Santa Claus. Yeah, change is a lot of work. Every time they make changes at your work, you've got to do extra work. You've got to put in extra hours. Every time they move your office, you've got to pack it all up. So all these changes are really annoying. Sometimes they're so annoying, you just assume to quit. Well, in today's economy, people are quitting a lot. But you just wait. As soon as the economy improves, people are going to be leaving places that annoy them and frustrate them so fast, it'll make your head spin. It's just they're waiting. There have been this accumulation of resentments. People who are bad bosses thought they could get away with being mean to people. 
But assuming the economy never does straighten out, there's going to be big repercussions, and some companies are going to suffer from the lack of wisdom of their wages. So yeah, and, and and by the way, a lot of this too is that people, when changes occur, do you like surprises? You don't like surprises. How about surprise parties? Yeah. Just like hey. <laughs> Let's just check this out. Do you like surprise party? Not really. Do you ever have one? Yeah. Not, not, not fun. What, what do you like? Let's let's say that we are, nobody knows that it's your but it's today's your birthday. And suddenly there's this breakfast going on and, and the scene telegram comes in. Some guy comes in. What, what do they call it? The the, uh, the guys that uh, are, are well built and come in. Chippendales. Chippendales. Yeah. <laughs> some some embarrassing carrying on like that that somebody thought would entertain you and it's really embarrassing. Surprise? Yeah, right. You can think that's a surprise. So that's that's not fun, right? And in fact, a lot of surprises are fun. And basically, a lot of us don't. I used to enjoy giving people surprise parties. And then, then I was given one. <laughs> yeah. My own personal experience with that was that everything was out of control. Totally out of control. And as each new person showed up, and these were people I had seen within the last week, and I they totally fooled me. And I was so good at putting these on, I figured they would fool me. It was, it was just really bothering me. You ever hear something like that? Yeah? Not my idea of fun. After that, I never gave anybody another surprise party. It was like, I'm tired of this. Yeah. 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 So, in a lot of ways, we don't like surprises because they make us feel out of control. And we, we need that sense of control. We keep a kind of equilibrium in life. So, if, if if, you know, today you're you're working here, and, and then without warning tomorrow you're going to be sent to Dallas. Um, why am I thinking in Dallas? Anyway, but I mean Texas is hot. They have tornadoes and you know snakes and all kinds of things. So what are some other surprises you would like to have at work? Getting fired. <laughs> yeah. Where am I going to live? It usually doesn't come with your knowledge. <laughs> yeah, yeah, what else? Do I relocate you? Could they give you some creepy job? You could be working there, but now you got to... Is, is there anybody at work that you would prefer not to report to? Like, oh my god. What else bad could happen? Pay cuts. Did I do that like playoffs? <laughs> <laughs> Poor Jim, he'll he'll go on into eternity doing this stupid blow up on playoffs. <laughs> yeah, I mean it just your life starts to fall apart and crumble in front of you with this kind of stuff. So Change is tough. And we've already talked about, hey, most of these changes are planned by somebody, not you, though. Because if you plan them, everything would be fine, right? And they didn't ask you either, right? Somebody somewhere decided to do something stupid, and you're, you're being victimized by it. Isn't that the way it happens? So, what do you do? Well, you can do a thing, but we're going to talk about it. So let's look at some other things that happen, like big, big changes <laughs> in companies. Um, you know what's really weird about this stuff? It happened all at once. <clears throat> it's like nobody was studying change. There were a few books that were under the radar in the 50s and 60s. 
And then along in 1980, NBC, the network, they're having their own problems, right? What's their big problem these days? Yeah, it's like, well, they had this great idea. I mean, I, I can't believe no heads have rolled yet, those overpaid executives. I was wondering about this. Wait a minute. We watch TV to see what? Executives are talent. What do you turn the TV on for? Yeah, you want to see talent. Who gets paid more? You know who Michael Eisner is? He ran Disney for a number of years. Do you know what he got paid at Disney? 90 million plus a year for over a decade for making decisions about which movie they should make and stuff like that. So finally, the, uh, <clears throat> the nephew of Walt Disney started raising hell about it in the corporate meetings and they finally got him out of there. Oh, by the way, the two guys that reported to him made 80 million each. So they were doing stuff where they, they moved the chess pieces around, but they couldn't sing, they couldn't dance, they couldn't draw cartoons. So we got a lot of that in, in the people who manage the talent. And it's the talent, whether it's athletes or singers or actors, unless some of that talent scout. There is one example. What's, what's that guy? And I never watched the show, but uh, some of you, I'm sure, must watch it. The ratings wouldn't be where they are. American. Yeah. I thought we weren't supposed to have idols. What's his name? Simon Cowell. Cowell. Yeah. Simon Obnoxious. And, and that persona he projects gets him ratings, right? But I understand he's going to abandon that because he's got some other gig. So anyway, in 1980, NBC puts on this documentary for two hours called A White Paper, colon, If Japan Can, Why Can't We? And this documentary was mostly about a guy who was past retirement age at the time. Anybody know his name? His last name was Deming. He studied physics at Yale after finishing a bachelor's degree at the University of Wyoming and a master's at the Colorado School of Mines. But he didn't do physics. He became a statistician. And during the Depression, he was the number two guy in the Bureau of Census, figuring out how to do statistical sampling of the population because, you know, you really can't go out and count everybody in America, even though certain congressmen think that's the way it should work. You can't do it. It's impossible. It's too big. You need, you need to take samples and do accurate estimates. So he figured all that stuff out. Then when World War II came along and we had to make all this military stuff, you know, rifles, jeeps, trucks. You know what the consequence was if your rifle jammed, if your jeep broke down, if your truck broke down, if your tank broke down? You're dead. You're dead. That's right. If you're sitting here behind a fallen tree and you've got a gun, and as long as you can keep going bang, 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 you'll stay alive and then it jams and it doesn't go bang, bang, bang anymore. You can only hit one person and the next thing you know, they're sticking a bayonet into you. So the quality, the reliability of your equipment is pretty critical. So this is where Deming became very famous because he figured out all the statistical formulas for making quality stuff that didn't break. Because in the beginning of World War II, there were a lot of problems. Because they were converting plants that made sewing machines into plants that made rifles fast after Pearl Harbor. And the first 
months of productivity were <coughs> junk. So at the end of the war, after the Japanese were defeated and had two cities blown up, the uh, occupation force told the JUSE, the Japanese Union of Scientists and Engineers, that we would help them rebuild and they could have any American experts they'd like to come over to educate them and, uh, and tell them how they could get out of the mess they're in. It wasn't that nice. So the person they wanted to have come to Japan was Deming because they'd read his papers about doing statistical sampling and how you could really radically improve quality. So he was asked by General MacArthur to go over there, and he did. And he spent a long time over there, and he loved it. He really loved the Japanese, and they loved him. And you can tell this because in 1950, they created this huge medallion with his profile on it called the Deming Prize to give the company that had made the most progress in improving quality. Now I'm just bringing this up as an example of, hey, this, this was real change. You take a country that's been smote a nearly fatal blow, demolished, and you try to bring them up from the ashes like the phoenix, that's a big change. But these people willingly tried to do everything he suggested they do. And they believed that if they did, as he had promised, he says, if you do everything I say, <clears throat> your economy will find new greatness in 20 years. So what happened? When did people first start buying lots of Honda Accords? About 20 years after that. So, thus, in 1980, we got this NBC thing. If Japan can, why can't we? <clears throat> and they're out following Deming around, and they're interviewing him and interviewing other people at GM and Ford and so forth. And they say, you know, okay, if, if Japan listened to this guy and they turned themselves around, why are we sitting here with economic problems? Why don't we do what they did? Well, there was lots of. By the way, we have this white paper in the library. Like to, <clears throat> if you'd like to look at it, you can do that. It's a historically interesting document. Because you know what? We really haven't moved that far from where we were. One of the problems of plan change. <laughs> it doesn't always work. Oh, gee, what did Emily say earlier? People playing change. Resistant. You can tell people how they can be healthier, <clears throat> slimmer, trimmer, richer. Probably won't do it, will they? Look at all the people that could never quit smoking until they were diagnosed with cancer. So, when they're they got six months to go, they quit smoking. So 1980 comes and goes, and then all of a sudden, all these books are coming out about how to manage change. A guy by the name of Tom Peters, who I love to watch give talks. Tom's a very bright guy. But the funniest presentation I ever saw at a professional meeting. So Tom given Baltimore to 
12 years ago. Now, Tom is about my size, except he's a little chunkier. In fact, that day, don't ever do this as a representative of Villanova, but he was such a superstar, he could get away with anything. <clears throat> he shows up at this professional conference with 10,000 people in attendance to be the keynote speaker, and he's wearing shorts and a t shirt. You know, I suppose that if he were uh, ripped, it might have been okay, but Tom's beyond ripped. Um, Tom's got promise sticks. You know? I mean, and it's not because he's doing squats with 350 pounds, because he's eating too many drumsticks, probably. But he told me about uh, probably around 91 that his consulting fee per day was 35,000. He was getting advances for books that were several million dollars. His first book, In Search of Excellence, which he wrote with Kevin Waterman, was a huge seller. This was a management classic. These, these two guys who were engineering graduates from Cornell, one of the top five engineering schools, Penn State, MIT, a couple others, Purdue. And then he got a PhD from Stanford. Now, hopefully you realize that Stanford is one of the top schools in the United States. So these guys were consulting for one of the big six firms. And when they got this gig, they were going out interviewing all the people in these top companies who were regarded as the most excellent companies in the United States. <clears throat> they published this book, which looked at what were their truly excellent companies. It was a hit. Everybody wanted to read it because they wanted to emulate what these companies were doing. This got him going on this high-priced speaking and consulting business. Oh, what's he doing these days? He has a farm in New England. He owns a company that makes training videos and films. His revenues from publishing books and writing scripts and movies and stuff like that are probably 20 million a year. I mean, he doesn't make as much money as Jimmy Buffett, but he doesn't have to pay for two airplanes either. So Tom Peters is a management guru superstar. It has been for a long time. But he's kicked this off in the right around 1980, when he was pretty young still. Who else came out of the woodwork at that time? Well, we had some interesting people. Two guys, Deal and Kennedy, wrote the first book on corporate culture. Up to that point, nobody had much talked about corporate culture. But suddenly, people read this book. And I'll, my, my, one of my revelations from reading that book was, all of a sudden, I understood why I hated working in a couple places I worked. It's like, oh, now I know why I like being there. Guy named Peter Senge, who is a professor at MIT, we're in a book called The Fifth Discipline in 1990. Japan and Youth Quality Circles. So, the thought was, hey, if we do things like they do in Japan, we'll get the same results. Well, after a while, people realized that, wait a minute, 
We can't do everything like in Japan because we have a different culture. Much more heterogeneity here. Much more homogeneity in Japan. But there was an interesting author who was working on another, another PhD from Stanford. He was of Japanese ancestry, but he'd never been to Japan. He didn't speak the language. But he decided, gee, maybe I'll get in touch with my origins and do a dissertation about Japanese management. This turned out to be a book called Theory Z. You've heard of Theory X and Theory Y, right? Right? Thank you for nodding. Theory X manager, according to McGregor. What would I be inclined to behave like toward members of the class? What assumptions would I make about your behavior in class if, let's say, you, you weren't um, as responsive as I thought you should be. If I were a theory X person. You should check out. Um, didn't some of you have? Um, yeah, some of you did have. Or sensational psychology. Yes, this time I guess. Well, Go check that out on your uh, Google. Theory X, theory one. McGregor, who was a sociologist, he cooked that up. So then he got Theory Z, which is something related to those. And it's a book about Japanese management. So then he got uh, Alvin Toffler, who wrote that book, Future Shock, I referred to. He ends up writing several more. They're talking about the wave of progress associated with changes having to do with information. You know, we become the information society. People don't make stuff anymore. They just figure out how to get you more information faster and faster until you're going nuts by your overload. Well, we finally reached the point where Daniel Pink wrote a book a couple of years ago, in 2005, entitled A Whole New Mind, which is what you need after all of that. A brain transplant. But this takes us back to the beginning. Back before Socrates. In, in the history of philosophy, Socrates is this dividing line. And there are a group of Greek philosophers who are called pre Socratic philosophers. They were, they were around before Socrates. And one of them is the guy who started the study of change. His name was Heraclitus. Into the river, and you 
take your foot back out again. If you step into it again, will you be stepping into the same river? So how many of the rest of you say, no, it's a tiger river? How many of you say it's the same river? How many of you don't say nothing? You can raise your hand to show me you're not saying anything. No, we're just going to have mute. This is really a complicated issue. Because it's an issue that looks at the interdependence of your actions and your environment. I mean, you're right. I mean, define change, define river. Look, anybody here from Texas? You ever heard of the Rio Grande? Where is, where is that river? certain parts of New Mexico. But during the spring, there's lots of water going through there. You know, you can do rafting. But by August, it's a series of puddles. You can do a place to go fishing. Probably just find a few rattlesnakes. Is it still the Rio Grande in the middle of August? Is it still a river? What defines a river? See, it's... But on the other hand, when you step into that river, I'm not sure some of you laugh about the idea of stepping into the school game. <clears throat> when you step into that river, you're doing things to the river, right? You're, you're, you are changing. Stirring up some mud. God knows what else. Your stinky feet get in there. Don't want you people drink that stuff. But also, the water's cold. It might have bacteria that could affect you. <coughs> so there's the interaction. You change it, it changes you. And that was really Heraclitus' point. It's, it's not simple. It's not, it's not that, I mean, you could say, sure, obviously. The water that's going by when I step in the first time, when I step in the second time, is 20 feet downstream. So it's, I'm stepping into different water. It's the same river because what is a river? A river is a channel that has water in it. Maybe, maybe not. Channel. It makes it the school kill. I mean, if the thing dries up, there's no, no water, it's still the school kill. Right? Heraclides was very interesting because he's way back then, earlier than 500 BC, he was figuring out the complexity of change and complexity of interaction and influence. It's complicated. One of the best books to come out about change came out in 1972. It also shows us and some of these psychology majors should be aware of this. Did any of you ever want to be psychotherapist? No, no, that way, nuts. Are you nuts? So you didn't want to work with people with problems. Huh? You don't care about people, do you? 
So it's not that you, you once thought this is what, what you want to do, but you wised up. It's just that you never really wanted to do that. That's okay. <clears throat> I played around with it for a while. And I was like, oh my God. How frustrating. You really can't fix these people. It's like cars that are broken. You can't buy parts anymore. So, so what do you do? Well, it still is the area in which change was first studied and most studied. So how do we take people who, who really, really want to change? You know, people have problems. They want to change. They want to lose weight. They want to stop drinking. They want to stop smoking. People want to change, right? We said New Year's. What are people doing for New Year's? What a silly way to die with this, but how many, how many of you <coughs> resolutionaries have New Year's resolutions that you're BSing yourself about? Huh? I saw those expressions. I was really cute. Yeah, yeah. I don't. Do you have goals written down that you're going to accomplish in this new year? Yeah, there's things I'd like to accomplish this year. You have written down? I mean, I know what they are. Tell anybody? Well, graduate, get a job, pass the PHR. <laughs> That's 10 minutes. If you tell other people, it's more likely you'll do them. You know why? Because your friends will put pressure on you. They'll remind you, they'll bug you. If you don't tell anybody, if you keep it a secret, you know what's going to happen. You're really not serious about it because you don't want any more pressure and you're not going to pressure yourself. Most of those resolutions are hot air and nobody's going to do much about them. I mean, last year, how many of you had a resolution? See, what is a New Year's resolution? It's a half-baked change plan. But if it, were, if it were fully designed, if you had a recipe, if you had a plan, probably would work. Plans have to be written down. They work. So a lot of what we're going to talk about is different ways of planning and doing things that make sure that change happens. You get the results you're after. And you know, a lot of what HR leaders are supposed to do is to design change and make sure it happens. But of course a lot of it doesn't happen and that's when they get rid of it. They do what you're supposed to do. But change is not easy. Change is very difficult. So, we're going to go through figuring out what we can do here. Well, there must have not been enough syllabi because nothing came back to me. Oh, there, there is something. There weren't enough syllabi on your article. Okay, well, I'll get you some of those. Who, who didn't get the article? Well, let's quickly go through the, the stuff you need to do to, to buy a book check. There was one that didn't have any more, and there's another one that we still can't buy, apparently, in the, in the bookstore right now. Which one's that? Um, which one is it? The, the, strength, the strength, the quality strength. You can, you can probably get that at Barnes and Noble so cheaper. And the chain, the critical chain, and the other stuff. Critical chain is out. Yeah, you can find that anywhere online. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't want much. Yeah, you know, you buy books where you want to buy them, but uh, there there are better prices some places. Okay. Um. <coughs> 
Okay, the Mary Walton book should still be around in lots of places. Uh, there's a whoops here. This is no longer French and Bell. It should be Cummings and Worley. And there is a new version of the syllabus coming out within a day or two. Uh, we were, we're putting into a new um, template to get it organized differently. So the critical chain uh, is not in the store, but you can get it uh, from various places. Uh, Barnes & Noble is pretty easy. Cameron and Quinn book from Madison Wesley is readily available. The uh, strength finders thing is pretty easy to get a hold of. Um, so, yeah, what I want you to get busy on is reading the first chapter of the Cummings and Worley book. That's the main text. And, and to, um, as soon as you get the Gold Red book, that's a paperback novel, it's fiction. So just get zooming on it. And, uh, and get the strengths finder so you can figure out what your strengths are. Because basically what it does, the book gives you, make, don't buy a used book either. For that one, don't buy a used book because somebody will have taken and used the code inside of it. The code allows you to go to the website for the book <coughs> and to access the Strengths Finder 2.0 instrument. This is a self-report test you take online and it gives you your top five strengths. Why is that important? Well, which do you think is going to get you further? To understand what your top five strengths are and use those to make accomplishments or to try to get through on something that you're really not good at. For example, how many of you can't sing worth a lick? Do you think you ought to go try for American Idol? I suspect if you've ever watched some of those programs, you can see they're not too kind to people who had the misjudgment to try out when they have no talent. So where is your talent? Where are your strengths? What are you good at? It's important to know. It's important to put your investment in those things which you already have a head start at. If you're a fast runner, and when you try to swim, you sink to the bottom, what do you think you should try, track or swimming? Thank you. <laughs> but, you know, every year there are, you know, they have this Iron Man thing. You know? Every year somebody sinks and drowns because they, they should have stuck to running or bikes or something. Figure out what they are. This book will, will do it. So it's, the book is good because what it does is once you get your report, you print it out, you got it, then you sit down with the book. And you go back and forth between the report and the book. It helps you figure out how you can have a strategy to get it, get further with the abilities and strengths you already have. So that's that's lots of fun. But this is a very effective way to to mentor and develop the people that you manage. It's not just about you. It's also about you being a leader. You being a manager. Because if you're going to be effective, you have to work with the strengths of the people who work for you. Okay? So, uh, in the two emails that I referenced earlier, you've already seen what two major, uh, two of three assignments are. You have the first shorter paper. That, that's coming up real quick, so get busy on it. Get it in. And also, I suggest that Take your paper to somebody in the reading center a week early so you can get some guidance on how you can improve it. And, and don't start thinking, well, I always got this or that grade, it must be okay. Anybody 
can improve. And the two most important predictors of your career success are, according to three longitudinal studies done with employees of AT&T from the 40s, 50s, 60s, two things. Anybody know what they are? Spoken communication and written communication. People who are good writers, people who are good speakers, are the people who do the best in their careers. So, work on those things. Being a great communicator is really helpful. So that first assignment, uh, what's your recollection of what I said you should do in that first paper? Do you remember that at all? The trumpet is drowning you out. Yeah. I think that's a trumpet. Huh? Yeah. Uh, comparing <coughs> and contrasting the changes in OD, that's all I can remember. Well, you have three things. You have training versus OD versus change management. Change management and OD are quite similar, but they're not exactly the same. But training also involves changing things, right? I mean, if we train you, we're going to teach you some stuff. So at the end, hopefully you're different. But training and OD aren't the same. They kind of overlap, but they're not the same. So I want you to think hard about what the overlap looks like. Okay? And then paper number two. It's longer. What else besides being longer? You get to choose the topic. Hmm? You get to choose the topic. Yeah, the reason I'm giving you a list is just to help some of you who, who might be overwhelmed by figuring out, oh my God, what are the possibilities here? So, I figure, okay, we're going to give you at least 20 hot topics that you can choose if you don't have something you're already already burning with desire for. Okay? And then we end up with a uh, take-home exam, which deal with some of the central issues that we go over in the course. That's it. Dr. Bush, what do you mean by presentations based on the papers? Um, I think that's a remnant of an old version of the syllabus. Okay. <laughs> because, you know, how this, this, that's why we changed to a new template, because you use last year's version and you update the dates and all this stuff, and sometimes some sentence or so uh, that didn't belong there gets left in. So this is a very temporary version that will be replaced. You'll probably get <coughs> an email attachment for the next class, which will have new stuff, and it'll it'll be prettier. There's different boxes and all kinds of stuff. It's the same basic thing that some of you've already seen that we used in metrics. So, um, and most of you know what plagiarism is and why not to do it and all that good stuff. But we have to discuss it every year because there's always somebody who either forgot or, or was missing that day. Like, well, what happens to people who, um, who cite stuff from Wikipedia? Pardon me? No, we do more interesting things. Like we hang them upside down out the window or something like that. But no, that's been. I understand that now that you get executed in high school if you use Wikipedia, but don't do it. And in fact, I would prefer you didn't cite any web stuff at all. Look at serious peer reviewed journal articles, what we call primary information sources, stuff that.
the people that are creating knowledge, not the people who are, you know, like never use an encyclopedia. And Wikipedia is like a port. It, that's, a, that's an encyclopedia written by people that you have no idea who they were. They could be drug dealers off the street. You don't know. So, there you go. Change. It's tough stuff. And then, what kind of change happened when the economy went south over a year ago? True. Of the two types we talked about, was that planned or unplanned? Unplanned. Unplanned, that's right. So there's a lot of that going around. Yet, yet we have to have contingency plans, right? We have to have disaster planning. Because we've had too many examples of disasters really can happen. It's just like, I hope you're not driving on bald tires, are you? Okay, thank you, good to see you. So if you have any questions, just uh, send an email.